everybody, my name's Ed. Okay, so I finally got my copy of Sex Criminals Volume 3 uh, by Mac Fraction and Chip Sadarsky. And I was going to do a video on it, uh, but then I thought it might be fun to not only talk about this comic, but to talk about a couple other comics that have to do with uh, sex and sexuality. And uh, I thought it'd be funny to compare, uh, or not funny, but I thought it'd be interesting to compare... Um, you know, stories that were completely different. So we're going to do uh, Sex Criminals, which is more of a satire, Paying For it by Chester Brown, which is a autobiographical comic, and then we're going to do Gita of Alazar by Frank Thorne, which is kind of set in the fantasy genre. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to have a drink here. There's beer in here. And uh, and let's get to it. Okay, so we're going to start with Sex Criminals by Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky. Uh, Matt Fraction's done a ton of work for Marvel for over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. He's not there anymore, and so now he's concentrating more on his indie work. Uh, Chip Zdarsky, uh, as of, you know, me filming this right now, is still over at Marvel. Uh, I think he's doing Tower of the Duck now. I don't read it. Uh, but yeah, uh, the whole premise of the comic, for people who don't know, is two main characters are uh, John and Susie, and their thing is, when they have sex or when they orgasm, they have the power to kind of stop time. And in previous in the previous volumes, Basically, they decided to use that to rob banks, and they were basically robbing the banks because the bank that John, I think it was the bank that John was working for, but basically, Susie worked for a library. The library was getting closed down, for, and like I said, I think it was John's bank that was closing down on us, so they were going to use the money to save the library or whatever, so and that was their intent. Now, along the way, they discover that there are other people who have uh, similar things happen to them, they, similar paranormal occurrences when they orgasm as well. And there's an organization of quote-unquote sex police that's basically trying to keep everybody uh, under wraps and everything like that. Now, having said that, that's kind of like the high concept part of the comic. Uh, but the other part of the comic book that I kind of like is the whole kind of, um, I don't know how do I put this, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting ideas and concepts about sex and sexuality and how people feel about sex, what you're taught when you're growing up or misconceptions you might have versus what the reality is as an adult, uh, how people deal with sex and relationships, how they don't deal with sex and relationships and, and things like that. And I actually find that part really, really interesting. In this particular volume, where they're at now is John and Susie aren't too sure uh, what, the, like I said, their plans haven't gone um, exactly the way they had hoped. The sex police people are after them, and so they're sort of kind of, you know, trying to avoid those people. Uh, we are introduced to like I said, more characters, even more characters who have these strange abilities when they have sex. One person is a former stripper, former porn star who's quit the business and now teaches college courses. Um, we meet one guy, <laughs> this is actually kind of funny, we meet one guy who works at a nursing home and, he's at, and he has to take home, care of his elderly mother. And when he does his thing, when he's alone, uh, I'm not too sure how much of it to give away, but let's say a Sailor Moon-ish type apparition appears, and that goes from one place to someplace else that's really a weird scene, and it's crazy, and it's over the top, but it's actually pretty funny. On uh, this edition, we also meet this other woman who is actually asexual, who kind of grew up trying to do the so-called normal things and tried to date and try to go out with boys, try to go out with girls, 
and figures out that she actually doesn't like having sex, you know. And um, and there is some other things going on here. John is seeing a therapist. There's some stuff going on where the therapist gets involved with the sex police person, although not knowing what was going on, or him not knowing that's who you is having a relationship with. And, um, and you know, and other things occur as well. Uh, stuff with John and Susie's relationship and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, for the most part, I actually liked it. There's a fair amount of satire in here. It's a little bit of postmodern, you know, snarky, mech, snark, snark stuff going on there. But most of the jokes work as far as I'm, I'm concerned. And like I said, uh, you get this sort of uh, take that you don't always get in, in pop culture. And I think I mentioned this in another video. You don't always get people being self-reflective. Um, yeah, that's what I want to say. Self-reflective about uh, sex in like these kind of lighthearted entertainment ways. You know, we normally get either James Bond type things or romantic comedy type things. But, you know, you don't always have characters talking about how... Um, you know, confused they were about sex growing up and, and things like that. Um, at least you don't get it, you certainly don't get it a lot in, in kind of lighthearted comic books like this. Uh, I also like the art, the layouts. I like a little, um, one thing I really like is the fact that a lot of what makes the comics work is they really do exploit the fact that it is a comic book and by that I mean the layouts the way things are paced a lot of the gags are just visual gags that you just literally cannot do um, in any other way oh I didn't mention I didn't mention these people uh, this is Susie's best friend and her gynecologist and they start dating and one weird thing going on with their relationship is hey there's there's David Caruso. But one thing about their relationship is even though the guy is a gynecologist, he really uh, hasn't had that many sexual partners. Or, yeah, he hasn't had that many sexual partners. And in contrast to the girl who's had a lot, and it actually kind of affects their relationship uh, uh, in a way that they're not necessarily on the same uh, wavelength, and there's a lot of self-esteem issues, um, self-esteem issues with them. And, um, and yeah, it, it, it causes, uh, it kind of causes a little rift in their, in their relationship. So, I think this is supposed to be Carl Sagan here. I think that's who that's supposed to be. Um, but yeah, just really, really nice colors here too. Uh, but like I said, for the most part, I really do enjoy this comic. I'm not too sure how long it's going to go. I'm guessing this first storyline is probably just the way the this is the third volume and just where I'm guessing we're at in the story. Maybe it'll go 20 issues, maybe 25. I can kind of imagine it going a little bit longer, but uh, <laughs> well, I better not show that. <laughs> but yeah, I can imagine it probably going a little bit longer. I can imagine it going a little bit longer. I'm not so sure how much story though they have in them. But yeah, like I said, uh, it's an enjoyable comic. Like I said, there's actually educational stuff in there, interesting historical things brought up. And, and so, yeah. 
uh, interesting uh, educational things, interesting historical things, um, self-reflective characters. Uh, characters are actually pretty likable, you know. If they were real people, you wouldn't mind hanging out with them. So, yeah, I would... Um, I know this comic isn't everybody's bag, but, you know, I would recommend, you know, people, you know, kind of giving it a peek. Okay, so the next one is Paying For It by Chester Brown, a comic book memoir about being a John. Uh, Chester Brown's been around for for a while, at least the, or actually I think he's been around for at least the mid-late 80s or so, uh, mostly doing indie comics. He did one comic called Yummy For which was this weird, crazy, um, offbeat, you know, serialistic humor. Then after that, he started doing more grounded things. Uh, he's done this uh, novel. He's done uh, something called the there was the Playboy. There's I Never Like You, and oh Jesus, there's the one he just did like a year or two ago that I'm blanking on the title of, but it was about a. Uh, historical figure or whatever. I, I can't think of it right this second. But uh, but this particular comic book is basically about Chester Brown's experiences with uh, visiting escorts. And as the story starts, uh, he's living in a house with his girlfriend and they have broken up, but they do still live in the same house. And, uh, you know, Chester talks about how he's actually better friends with her now, that they're just regular friends, they're not a boyfriend or girlfriend anymore. And and then having her get another boyfriend and and hearing their arguments and things like that, he comes to the realization of like, you know, he doesn't even want to have another girlfriend. He's not trying to have that type of relationship anymore. But of course, uh, we find out it's been almost two years since he's last had sex. And they weren't even before he broke up with his girlfriend. They had somehow stopped having sex or whatever. So he starts thinking about, you know, why not see um, an escort? No, I think what happens was they're going to some convention to uh, get a picture and an autograph with some model. And he starts thinking, you know, I'm waiting in this line. I got to pay 50 bucks. Am I you know, for a picture with this woman, am I that desperate to have a woman stand next to me? He's like, I could take this 50 bucks and buy a prostitute. Like, hearty, har, har. But then he goes home and starts thinking about it, thinking like, yeah, maybe he could. So, basically, like I said, he uh, starts, you know, visiting escorts, and the comic is basically him going through a process of kind of justifying his mind, him talking to it about it, with his friends, of course, his friends think he's weird, but they're like, you know, whatever. Uh, his relationship with the various women, how he kind of goes about it and everything. And like I said, his feelings on male-female relationships, sexual relationships, things like that. Uh, it's really interesting because it's really frank. I mean, I don't think most people would be willing to put themselves out there and talk about, you know, like I said, pain, pain for sex or whatever. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things going on. One thing I think that was a mistake that he did, or actually I should say this, I should say this, uh, you pretty much get all sides of it. Like I said, there's his position, there's what his friends think about it, and there's, you know, you get some of the, uh, the women to talk about what they do. And I think there was a real conscious effort to kind of humanize uh, some of the women. I think it's mitigated by an artistic choice he made. Uh, he talks about in the back, in the back matter, about how if you look, he never shows the faces of any of the women or prostitutes or escorts. Or I should take that back. He does show faces of women, but they're the women who are friends of his, who are like some normal, regular, platonic friends of his. But he doesn't show any of the faces of the, like I said, the prostitutes. And he says he did that because he kind of wanted to protect their privacy. However, um, it's a, you know, it's a comic book, you know? Nobody knows what anybody looks like. And if you want to protect their 
privacy, you know, just draw them different. If they have blonde hair, draw them as brunettes. Or if they are fat, draw them skinny. I mean, who's going to know, you know? I think an unintended consequence of that is since you don't see the women's faces uh, just by the way that comics work they represent less um, less people and then they kind of become concepts uh, like I said the, the he does try to put the personalities in it and he does try to humanize them but like I said I think that's kind of a um, you know, kind of a, a side effect that I think he wasn't really attending. Uh, the art, as you can see, is very uh, simple, for lack of a better word. I don't think it's simplistic, but simple, I think, is a good word. I got to be careful because some of these pages, uh, there's a lot of nudity in this comic, but it's in opposition where you normally see these things presented in the media or wherever. Uh I don't think any of it's meant to be titillating. It's all very kind of stark and matter of fact. Uh, I think it's really interesting, too, that Chester includes, you know, uh, uh, a few little bad experiences uh, that he had as far as, you know, maybe not having enjoyable sex or whatever. One ironic thing I think about it is, mild spoiler, he does kind of implies that he did end up having a traditional boyfriend-girlfriend relationship uh, with one of the women. Uh, another interesting thing is, oh wait, let's see here. I just find this is hilarious. This is the first time he's uh, thinking about uh, finding a, a, a prostitute or whatever. And he really had no idea what to do or how to go about it. So he's basically on his bicycle, just kind of <laughs> riding around town, trying to find uh, if, you know, where he thinks prostitutes might just hang out or whatever. <clears throat> and then, of course, he starts doing some research and figures out about, you know, how to call uh, people who have ads in certain papers and go to this phone booth, then go to another phone booth, then meet me at this place, um, you know, type of thing. That's another interesting thing. Um, the back matter is, is kind of interesting here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here about how the prostitution laws work in Canada and about how the police are more likely to uh, prosecute people under certain under certain situations, more likely to prosecute people under certain situations than they are under others. And then there's a lot in here. Uh, we're just basically having a debate, saying the pros and cons of legalized prostitution and basically trying to justify you know, his position on it. And there's also a lot of notes about the making of the of the book that we have here. And so there's a lot of, you know, on page 27, it's really two conversations I had with so-and-so at two different times, but it worked better narratively uh, to put them together and a lot of well, I showed Seth smoking, but uh, in real life, he said that he wasn't really smoking and yakety schmackety. And a lot of stuff where he actually had to confer with uh, some of the real life people that he's actually uh, drawn in the comic or whatever. So anyway, yeah, I think it's really, really interesting, really intriguing, even if you don't agree, you know, with uh, Chester Brown's whole um position, for lack of a better word, uh, it's still interesting, just like I said, just for the frankness of it and the kind of insight he tries to bring to the whole, uh, to the whole situation. Okay. Okay, so the next one 
is Gita of Alazar by Frank Thorne, and it's kind of on the other end of the spectrum for the last book we were talking about. This is set in the uh, fantasy world, and it's pretty much just a lighthearted romp. Uh, there's no politics, there's no you know intellectual messages or anything like that, no heartwarming or insightful things. It's just uh, you know sex, drugs, rock and roll, drunkenness, gore, nudity, and it's just basically for fun. Uh, it's a sensationalism and titillation, um, but it isn't mean-spirited. It's just kind of, a, like I said, a lighthearted romp. Uh, it doesn't really take itself too seriously. Obviously, Frank Thorne just wants you to have a, a good time with his story, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that, I think. Uh, Frank Thorne's mostly known for probably doing um, Red Sonja for Marvel back in the 70s, and after he left Marvel, he started working on this character. He also did a bunch of other stuff, other characters for other magazines. He's done stuff for Playboy. He's done stuff for Heavy Metal. Uh, and a lot of it was kind of cheesecake-oriented and, and whatnot. And like I said, I don't think that's necessarily a problem, you know, provided you're doing it, uh, you know, for the, you know, for the right sort of audience and, um, and that you're good at it. Uh, Frank Thorne is actually your... Uh, a really good artist, in my point. Uh, he's able to understand anatomy and things like that. So, uh, so yeah. So just to describe these premise, uh, basically, as it starts, it's uh, Gita and this guy here, who is the wizard Thenath. And basically, what it is, uh, the wizard is kind of the palace or kingdom uh, sorcerer, if you will. And Gita is basically his main consort, and they're living at the palace. And a big joke of it is he's really not a good wizard. He's more of a con man and a drunkard. And they've just somehow sort of like talked their way into having this position. But as the story opens, the kingdom is being overrun by trolls, and they're, you know, ransacking the village. Uh, the king has been mortally wounded. And he wants them to resurrect their greatest warrior who is killed in battle. Things don't quite go as planned. Uh, they have to flee the uh, flee the kingdom. Uh, Gita ends up with uh, the warrior's sword. Uh, they try to pick up some armor, but the armor doesn't fit her because she's a female and the armor's designed for men. So they kind of cut it up into these little pieces that she just barely covers herself up with. And they also meet uh, this guy here who's kind of a half troll and he's been uh, abused by the main trolls and because they're nice to him, he kind of, you know, joins them in their voyage or whatever. And uh, and that's basically the, the setup. Uh, like I said, it's uh, there's some violence in there, there's some gore, not tons of gore, but uh, characters get their limbs cut off. Uh, the main character is topless, maybe half the book, I would say. Uh, but like I said, it's uh, it's a lighthearted romp. It's mostly funny where it's supposed to be funny. Uh, the dialogue isn't the best in the world, but it does work. I'd say the biggest problem with it is probably that it's overwritten, believe it or not. Uh, there's tons of... Uh, uh, exposition in the comic, and I kind of get the feeling that a lot of it was just unnecessary. I kind of felt that some of these things that they cut down on the caption boxes would make the whole story flow a little bit better. Uh, but like I said, it is a entertaining comic. Uh, just to show you a little bit of the art that I think I can get away with without getting, uh, getting banned or anything like that. Uh, but look, you got some really interesting layouts, really nice composition. Here you can see example of some of this. Like I said, it's really overwritten. I just think a lot of that just is so not completely necessary. Uh, there is, some, like I said, there's lots of nudity. There's some some sex, some weird stuff going on. Uh, but uh, like I said, it is a 
Okay, I can see there. I'm not going to show you this one because there's a dong in it. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Here it is. She's half naked, half naked, half naked. Um, here we go. Now she's got some armor on. There's some trolls right there. Uh, let's see here. Here is up. Oh, there's some strip teas. Here's them getting drunk. Here's them smoking weed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> More toplessness. Here's chopping up the trolls while being topless. Here is some more crazy stuff. Some more zaniness. Uh, but okay then. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So yeah, you've got the fantasy genre romp. You've got the uh, gritty memoir. And then you've got the kind of high concept satire. And, uh, and yeah, I think they're all really interesting in very different ways with the very different themes and takes on uh, sex and sexuality. So yeah, that's it. I got to thank you very much for watching. Uh, leave any comments. Thanks and have a great day.